Hello, we're going to read chapter nine of Girl Caught by Florence Webb Maxwell. Just as I turned into the school gate and crossed the field, the first bell was ringing. I rushed into the classroom and noticed with dismay that Eileen was not in her seat. A cluster of girls around Bella Smith drew my attention. Bella Smith felt superior to the rest of us because her father was a member of colonial par parliament. With her long legs crossed, she was perched on top of her desk, engaged in conversation with six girls standing around her, gobbling up maids in waiting, I thought as I glanced at their attentive faces. I had no idea what the conversation was about, but soon, as soon as Bella saw me, her lips snapped together and seven pairs of eyes shot in my direction. Kate Bean was the first to break the huddle as she stood on tiptoe, her usual stance because she is barely four feet, and looked at Bella out of the corner of her eye. I hear there's a boycott tonight and it involves the movie theater, she said, clearing her throat and issuing the statement as if delivering an important address to an expectant crowd. Ignoring the remark, I opened the top of my desk to get my favorite maths book. I sat down and tried to concentrate on the exercises on the page, but this was not possible for the boycott soon became a lively discussion. I'll be right in the front line. No way I'm going to miss the action, someone from the back of the room shouted. My uncle lives in the States and the West Indies and he said boycotts are dangerous. The police bring out dogs and guns. Police don't carry guns here. Everybody in the room began talking at once and I tried to block out the conversation until Dedrick Smith yelled, Desma, are we still invited to the movies on Saturday? Say yes, Desma, chimed in his clown friend, Hugh Hawkins. That would make your party more exciting. Hey Desma, I hope your party has booze to go with your celebration. Someone near the front of the room joined in. I, earned the pa I turned the pages of my math book, hoping to erase the laughter that erupted. Don't bet on it. Dedrick made his belly laugh soar above the class uproar. Count on Desma to have a dry party, someone shouted. The voice sounded like Bella's. Her parents are big time Christians. I saw Charity Lamb clench her teeth when she looked at Bella and then shook her head with such vigor that I thought I was going to, it was going to separate from her shoulders. I included her in my birthday celebration, hoping her father would let her attend. She was more mature than it, most of my classmates. The clatter of the second bell tore through the conversation, saving me from jumping up and making a remark. I wish Eileen were here, for she would have had a ready retort. The entire room became quiet, as quiet as a morgue, and we lined up at the door to go to assembly. Mrs. Goldenrod, the civics teacher, appeared in front of us and blocked the doorway. With one hand on her slim hip and the other pointing straight us, she resembled a teapot about to pour out unpleasant information. Go back to your seats. We obeyed with military precision. Even the two class clowns had the good sense not to show off for Mrs. Goldenrod, who was the most unpopular teacher in our school, mainly because she doled out detention like jail rocks. I did not like her because she favored the boys in the class, the girls who were pretty and those whose parents had important positions. As I watched her out of the corner of my eye, I shuddered inwardly. My blouse was sticking to the back of my seat, but I endured the discomfort, not daring to shift while her, her eyes were roving. First, they rotated to the front of the room, resting on each student. Then they traveled to the back and my heart dropped into my lap as the headlights she called eyes glared into my direction. Stand up, Desma Johnson. My glued blouse prevented me from moving quickly. Desma Johnson, stand up now. I hopped to my feet, aware that my entire class was watching, each person relieved that he was not the victim caught in her deadly headlights. What's she done? I heard someone whisper from behind me. She's never in trouble, I recognized Hugh's voice, and he seemed amused. She is now, whispered Dedrick. Mrs. Goldenrod heard the conversations that were beginning to circle around her, but she did not call the class to order as was her habit. Something was wrong, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why I was single, singled out. I knew I was not one of her pretty favorites, nor were my parents considered prominent in her book. I did remember once she had accused me of trying to undermine her authority when I was in Form 1. She had written her civics notes on the blackboard and we were supposed to copy them verbatim. I'd put them in my own words, not realizing she collected the notebooks to make certain we had copied correctly. To my horror, I was put into detention and made to rewrite the notes her way. She called me an arrogant first former who did not know her place. Neither of us forgot that incident for my five years at Collegiate Institute. I prided myself on avoiding any confrontation with Oldie Goldie. 
I was also thankful that our local civics was not included in the Oxbridge School Certificate Exams. She had no power over me as a senior until now. Do you know why you're standing? She asked, pointing a finger from one hand while she rested the other in the usual spot on her hips. She underlined the question by snapping her mouth shut, thereby causing three vertical creases to form parallel lines on her top lip. No, Mrs. Goldenrod. The words seemed to stick to my dry tongue and I wasn't even sure I had spoken. Speak up, I didn't hear you. No, Mrs. Goldenrod. I shifted on one leg and wondered if a victim in front of a firing squad felt as traumatized. Then I will inform you. Instead of putting me out of my misery, her headlights roved around the room, front to back, and finally they rusted to my anxious face. My body felt as lifeless as a rag doll. You have set a bad example to this class and to the rest of the school as well, she said at last. I felt the air being sucked out of the room and silence seemed to rush in to fill the vacuum. This is ludicrous, what is she talking about? Oldie Goldie continued with a smirk on her face. The first bell has rung and as I walked past this door, I heard your name being called several times above the din. It was obvious that you were the center of this disturbance. Of course, as a senior and top student, you believe the rules don't apply to you. I had no idea what to do, so I just stood, waiting for the verdict. To my surprise, I heard her say in exasperated tone, yes, George. Without looking behind, I knew George had raised his hand. I wondered what was on his mind for he was Oldie Goldie's favorite, a fact she did not hide. Surely he was not going to challenge her and lose his precious spot on top of her totem pole. Uh, Mrs. Goldenrod, he began in his crisp voice, enunciating his words with authority. Desma was not responsible for the noise in the classroom. He paused and I knew he was waiting for permission to continue. Oldie Goldie pressed her two fingers to her lips and I could feel without turning around that the headlights were shining on him. Go on, George, now her voice was bubbling with venom. Please, George, don't get involved. But he continued, his tone stronger than before. Some people were talking about the boycott that's to happen tonight and wondered if Desma was still having her party on Saturday. She didn't get a chance to say a word because the second bell rang. I could almost hear her snorting through her nostrils. That's enough, George, you may take your seat. You also, Desma. Shifting her headlights from George to the rest of the class, Mrs. Goldenrod tripped away from the desk and back to the door. There she stood on the threshold, this time with both hands on her hips. I'm going to set a precedence today, her tone dropped to a menacing low octave. Menacing eyes swiveled in George's direction. Since you young man had the courage to inform me that the entire class was responsible for the mayhem, I have no choice but to punish the whole lot of you. Seniors or no seniors, you will all be put into detention. After the final bell, I expect to see every last one of you here in this classroom. With that ultimatum, she evaporated from the room, closing the door behind her. In an instant, there was an uproar. I have a job after school, so I won't be here, Kate said, pounding her desk to underline her resolve. Not to be outdone, Hugh and Dedrick rushed to the front of the class and began beating out a rhythm on the teacher's desk. Rat-a-tat-tat, chanted Dedrick. I knew he was imitating Mrs. Goldenrod's footsteps. There was a burst of laughter from some members of the class. Hugh, encouraged by the audience's response, was about to bring down his raised hand to join the performance when George walked up and grabbed his wrist. Get back to your seats, both of you. The two clowns scattered like frightened fowls and the entire room went mute. I propped my elbows on my desk and leaned forward, mesmerized by George's display of authority. Out of the corner of my eye, I again, again noted that his face was a perfect square and his nose in a Sosceles triangle, flared at the nostrils when he looked over the class. I became so engrossed with his geometrical features that I almost jumped out of my seat when someone poked me in the back and vo a voice snarled, thanks to you, the whole class is getting punished. Without turning around, I knew it was Kate whose desk was directly behind mine. But Kate was beside her before I could respond. Don't start anything, Kate. If you wanna take on something, someone attack me. He pointed his to his chest, his nostrils flaring. He then touched my shoulder. Don't feel guilty. Mrs. Goldenrod had no right to pick on you in the first place. Words stuck around my tongue. I wanted to thank him for coming to my defense, but instead, my face heated from embarrassment and my head bobbed back and forth like a punching ball. 
If George noticed, he paid no attention but gave my shoulder a squeeze and walked back to the front of the class. The classroom door burst open and Eileen suddenly appeared, grinning as she looked around. Before she could open her mouth, her Hugh burst out, we have a detention this afternoon and, I know, I know, I heard the commotion when Holdy Goldie handed down the sentence, she said with a laugh. I sneaked into the laboratory before she had the chance to see me. You're still in detention like the rest of us, Hugh said. But Eileen ignored him and came straight for my desk. Why are you so late, I asked, noting that she seemed in an unusually good mood. Much to tell you, she whispered. Talk at recess. She said no more when she sat down and soon became absorbed in a quiet activity, not daring to conjure up another demon to inflict a longer detention. I thought the recess bell would never ring, and when it finally did, she was the first to jump up from her desk and rush over to me. She grabbed my hand and pulled me to my feet. Quick, let's find a quiet spot, lots to tell you. Dragging me down the corridor, running as prohibited, and out to the playing field, she did not stop until we reached a wooden table, table with two benches at the very end, shaded by a flamboyant ponciana tree. She plopped down on the nearest bench, almost pulling me on top of her. I've got lots to tell you. Tell it for goodness sake, what's the matter with you? By now, I was more annoyed than curious. If her morning was exciting, mine definitely was not. I was harboring a dangerous secret, had inadvertently thrown my entire class in detention, and had caused George Strong to lose favor with Holy Goldie. And Eileen Richards had the nerve to be smiling? Don't look so miserable, she said, patting me on my cheek and grinning. I told Benny about our conversation last night, and he's come up with a solution. I waited. Patience seemed to be a new virtue for me. Remember you said you could pay for the class if we found a solution of getting into the theater without crossing the picket line? I remember, I said and, saw, and sighed. Well, it's solved. I was curious, but I knew Eileen well enough to let her tell the story in her own way, the long way. She swallowed and to my surprise, plunged in. Benny took me to meet his old girlfriend, the one who cleans the island theater. She can get the class through the staff door without crossing the boycott line. Eileen paused. She stared at me adopting what I call her lawyer pose, so erect her head made perfect right angles to her shoulders. I knew there could be a problem. My patience was draining away. Okay, Eileen, what's involved? Benny's ex mentioned the plan to her boss and the boss gave permission only if we pay in advance by five this afternoon. Eileen gave a sigh after this announcement. There's no way I can go to Papa's garage, get my post office book from his office, go to the post office, get the money and meet Benny's ex before five o'clock. I was appalled at such a thought. I told Benny's ex that we couldn't get the money that soon. Benny doesn't get off work until five, so he can't even take you to the post office. I tried to explain that to her, but she just shrugged and said there was no other solution. Eileen's face drooped. Besides, we have detention, remember? What are we going to do, Desma? I can't think of anything else. I knew that getting the class into the theater by the staff door and sitting in the white people section was a brilliant way to end segregation without breaking the law. I thought about Mrs. Burroughs and the special branch. Getting the money was the problem. Then an idea hit me hard on the forehead. I know how I can get the money. I'll get my post office book on my lunch break and then go straight to the post office. Let's hope I can get back to school before the first bell rings. This boycott business was becoming more and more problematic.